the topic or the title of the paper is biomass based rural revitalization in future india uh, i would also acknowledge that uh, this idea is going to put together in this paper primarily draws fire from uh, shri late shri kr dadi's work and his conceptualization of this type of a future in which many of us have been part of it and many of us share this vision and also try to ground it Uh, in some ways, that I can see in the lobby for it, lobby for, for it, like resonating with the people. Yes. So there are quite a few people who have been involved in those experimentation in this room itself. So it is more of a collective search. So I don't own any ownership on some of these ideas that we want to put forward. And in fact, it's up to the world to defend some of these ideas. So it's not only on me. <laughs> uh, in fact, there is an interesting book by Date, which uh, Swas and me, Swas and me, tried to help to put it together, called Banning on Biomass. A new strategy for sustainable prosperity based on renewable energy and dispersed industrialization. So I think uh, if you want to read the source, then I think one should. In fact, tomorrow we'll get a couple of copies here to display it also. Or so draws from that. And later, so as we try to apply this in the specific context for Sadar's you know, project when we wrote it. Alternative restructuring the project. We are trying to build up a third part into the book. In which some of these ideas can be. Uh, what we can demonstrate is potential in terms of taking uh, people beyond subsistence to much more of a uh, of what you call well-being or sustainable prosperity. It doesn't agree with the way probably prosperity whether it can be sustainable or not. But keeping aside uh, some of the discussion, that was the type of point which comes uh, into this. So the drawing is written by my other colleague Vilas Gorde, who has tried to ground uh, some of these technologies, which uh, probably I'm going to the uh, presentation. Unfortunately, he could not uh, come here today. Uh, in fact, uh, before we get into, uh, oh, sorry, this is, oh, yeah, uh, is that the paper has about four or five of the words structured into four or five sections. One is that there is a context setting which you are trying to do, in which you are trying to discuss out uh, the type of stagnation or the degeneration which is taking place in the rural areas, uh, both in terms of ecosystems as well as in terms of people's livelihood, the, how the ways are eroding, and also the wide spectrum of radical changes which is taking place in the rural areas. I think. In fact, that change is also contributing in a way to, uh, for example, this whole point of uh, what I call um, uh, stagnation or deterioration of people's language to some extent. Second, we are trying to introduce our concept of biomass. Biomass as the main provider of our needs, especially if we talk about rural societies. Uh, third, we have gone into some details about the type of uh, you know biomass-based feature which we are trying to vision, which has got primarily two uh, components. Uh, one is what we call uh, 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 basically, a type of a radical restructuring of the land and water use and land relations or water relations to some extent, which is taken as I mean, as one of the boundary conditions for this type of future to unfold. And second, which also meets basic uh, needs like food, fodder, fuel, in kind as much as possible without going through market and other type of commodity exchanges to as much as possible. It also produces certain biomass which goes as throughput in your agricultural systems. I think which is connects with what uh, Bharat and Vijay just said in the morning about you know uh, sustainable agriculture and other things, and also produces for family to two of about three to five tons of biomass. I mean that is the type of uh, you know uh, assumption we have made, and we have demonstrated in the context of Sadar Sarovar that this is possible to do it in terms of the structure. Now based on that, then we have taken the whole question of biomass based energy efficient. This was industrialization as a way out of the stagnation, in which we said that the way to organize is something we call integrated production from energy uh, generation units. I think so. This is the main, I mean, I would say the core of the paper to some extent. We also got into some details in what are the infrastructure sectors we have been able to make some breakthrough, where some of these things have been done, and some of the details of those uh, three sectors, basically water, buildings, and roads, where uh, some of these biomass uh, based projects. And finally, the paper ends with some of the limits in terms of our experimentation and some of the issues is toss up and how to take this way forward. So that's the broad coverage uh, of the uh, paper. Now, uh, coming to the first part that I'm not going to deal with much is that I mean this is uh, all of us are aware of it, and I don't think there is any contestation probably around those issues about what's happening to erosion of the rural livelihood to some extent, the type of changes taking place, and I would say uh, the type of farmer suicides. Taking place is a very most telling but very sad uh, testimony of this type of the crisis, the rural crisis which is unfolding in front of us. 
Uh, that's, uh, I mean, I don't want to get into some of those things, but if you look at, for example, the, one of the conventional indicators of relative contribution of agriculture and allied sectors to the overall economy, it has been over the years decreasing to some extent. Um, there is a decreasing productivity, even in the part of green agriculture, which is now more consistent and reported to some extent. Um, and also, there is, uh, I mean, if you look at the last uh, 20 years, of uh, various type of national surveys or uh, other type of service you find out, there are two things which are taking place in the rural areas. One is that there is a large scale land use changes which are taking place. Both conversion of agriculture and non agriculture land into various other type of uh, industrialization or other type of so even urban conglomerations are coming up with things which in a way. And I think even the so called wasteland which has been converted, and we should remember that wastelands are also basically both an ecological space as well as a livelihood space for the rural uh, toilets and things. Second, if you look at the whole corpus of the workforce in the rural areas, you find within the last 20 years, the category which used to be earlier, um, which used to be said as the order cultivator, has come down at least by 15% in the last 20 years. So it's basically you find that overall workforce is decreasing, especially the agriculture workforce is decreasing. So it's basically it's being made up by the non-agricultural cash flow and other people of labor So these are what we call broadly call a proletarianization of peasantry to some extent is that is And finally, in the scenario, we also said that what is the measure of, I mean, the you know, productivity decrease can be made up to various <coughs> measures. But one of the most dangerous things which you have been observing is that the whole primary productivity of the ecosystem. In fact, we make a distinction between primary and the secondary productivity, which in fact we learned from Dathiji's whole base of looking at sustainability to some extent has been that. Every ecosystem has its own productivity in terms of, uh, you know, innate productivity and things. What we have is today is that the sum total of primary productivity and what you have the incremental productivity which you use of, uh, use of through different of inputs, whether it is hybrid seeds, exogenous water, fertilizers and other type of things. But we have found that this whole primary productivity of the ecosystem is, uh, you know, going down. So we need a strategy which both we can tie up. One is that whether we can increase the primary productivity of the ecosystem on one hand and also it can be much more uh, broad based the livelihood base of the people to some extent and things. So I think so in that context and there are also people now writing say that I mean, it's not a new writing but there are earlier also that unless agriculture along with non-farm incomes are also proud into that economy probably then this stagnation we have no way out. So what we are saying is that then probably biomass based and approach can tie up this whole ecosystem needs to some extent also productivity and other type of things on one hand and second things can also open up a agro-industrial <coughs> or dispersed industrial production of values and value addition potential uh, to the uh, rural people. I don't want to get to that, so I mean partly what we all know that what is biomass. Biomass is basically the type of mass which you produce, uh, which will be produced through photosynthesis and other type of we are talking about the primary biomass in which all parts of the plant or a crop uh, has an important role to play. Today, in the traditional conventional agriculture is one of the harvestable part of the biomass, whether it is grain or fruits or seeds, which we do. But I think in this type of things we talk about, uh, all this away uh, uh, today. And one of the boundary conditions which we have uh, assumed is that, um, in fact, uh, this sort of, I would say this experiment or this type of study has been done in the rural Maharashtra to some extent, basically with the farming as the livelihood activity to some extent found that, I mean, don't take this 18 number and other type of numbers are very rigid type of numbers. It can vary to some extent according to the agro and other type of habits of the people and things. But broadly, is that if a uh, farmer family of about, you know, five members can either produce or get access to 15 to 18 tons of biomass, and here we are talking about dry biomass, when you take the water content out, then probably it can meet all its livelihood needs plus uh, produce uh, surplus biomass which can go into your agro industrial system. Now, there are details working of all this type of thing, probably I don't have the time to go into it. But main thing which I have to mention is that there is a one third of the biomass which can be recycled and used as a throughput in your agriculture systems. So that the uh, agriculture productivity, the nutrient requirements, improving the water body capacity of the soil, it can lead to some type of regenerative agriculture which I think Varadhav used uh, in the early session and type of thing. Oh, uh -huh. uh, and then we have about three to five type of biomass which is uh, basically uh, going into agriculture. In fact, there is also a technology choice which we make. I mean, uh, this uh, how you choose different materials for different functions. So one of the operational principles have been each of the materials optimally used for the function it carries out best. Now, for example, reinforced soil or cement is 
client to take uh, compressive loads, who to take inside loads and speed or connectivity. So through wires and that will be to take that, uh, give the confinement to a structure or other type of sort of uh, shear transparency, etc. We also go into the type of differentiating points about this type of technologies we are talking about and other conventional technologies uh, properly. I don't want to go into the details of this. Uh, I mean, it doesn't compromise on function. It has got much lesser or comparable in terms of lifetime costing or price. Energy saving to the extent of up to five uh, times. The whole higher proportion of the local material and labor. I mean, this is also trying to reverse the whole process today of the entire infrastructure development in which the entire material everything comes from exogenous or centralized production systems. And if you spend 100 rupees in the, any type of infrastructure project, about 80% goes into out of the rural economy. And here we can reverse the whole thing. There is a tremendous potential for skill upgradation and the main departure point here is that we need not be tied to caste traditions. Otherwise when we talk about artisanal productions, <coughs> very often tied to your caste and other type of things. Here there is a potential to go. It is available to modular designs and fabrications and can be brought in assembled like sites and things. So there are quite a few of these things. So the way we make choice of what technologies to be <coughs> given becomes an important Okay. So what we have done is that basically we have got three uh, infrastructure sectors we have chosen because we do feel that infrastructure is an important area for development to some extent. So the quality of infrastructure, what constitutes this infrastructure, what's the reach of this infrastructure also to some extent decides and things. So there are three basic things, water, buildings, both residential and public uh, facilities and roads as the three main interventions which have been done. In water we have been able to do Diversion storage structures, both which can take overflow as well as non overflow structures, there are tanks and buffer storages, linings, pipelines, etc. etc. Is that. Now, this is one of the first things in the 80s which we did in Orissa, which is called timber gabion structure, which is a small dimension timber which has been locally available, chemically treated, brought assembled by the local people, and uh, this is a type of pilot structure which you can see, which is still in operation in the last 20 25 years. So one of the first design. Now this has been mainstream today in any watershed development programs you see many people <coughs> use timber gabion structures. But unfortunately, 90 to 90 percent percent of the watershed which is a very local. What is that gabion? Is that the dam or what? Uh, this is a dam. This is a dam. water harvest, uh, water housing structure on a stream which can take overflow. Oh, okay. There is a design available. There are much more visuals which I don't know the type to go into uh, and things. Uh, this is some type of a canal uh, which actually stores the basically uh, the water comes through you know rainwater harvesting which means the needs of about 25 families I think that what I uh, what you call a fiber based lining under this which with bentonite or clay it acts as like an impermeable layer so you can also get away from let's say polyethylene or uh, plastic based liners which you find uh, in many places. This is a water tank. Buildings we have been able to make quite a lot of uh, headway. In fact, uh, uh, one of the things which I need to say is that in this type of an approach or a vision, we are not completely ruling out exogenous resources or even fossil based materials. It is basically a combination of both, which you see a composite material, which is the whole uh, thing. So, you steel, cement, concrete bricks, and synthetics, and along with that, bamboo, small dimension timber. And this small dimension timber, which I am talking about, is a diameter about, let's say, 75 millimeter to about 100 millimeter which in any type of a small forestry programs or as part of the watershed with a regeneration period about 5 to 6 years you can uh, grow because one of the pieces of this approach has been that it might lead to deforestation that which need not be uh, done. Now this is one of the interesting buildings an office building is a two story building uh, for a group called Inspiration which is also a group of architects in Kerala uh, near Cochin if somebody wants to visit you should go. Uh, it's a two-story building which is there, it's an external view. This is the bamboo, treated bamboo wall which has been constructed and things. Uh, this is the roof, the way it has been done and the roof is also done from top, is also in a very different manner. Uh, this is a cow shed that is also close to Pune where some of the buildings, I think there's a school building also which is uh, constructed like this. But I should also, ah, this is another one in Sangli, which I think Bharat and is also associated with, is that uh, um, because of the struggle of the deserted women, they got housing plots. And they set about 20 to 22 units, I think, have been built there, uh, with their now people started using it, using it, things. Now, these designs look very sleek and nice, but the initial set of buildings, if you go to Kasega, where Bharat comes from, we built a building there for their trust and things. They don't look so aesthetically beautiful. 
So that was the first set of designs which we did. So there was an improvement in the whole design. And one of the things that we, our main area of work was the structural stability of the whole thing. And since we could tie up with an architectural group in Kerala, they provided the much more the aesthetic and that type of you know, interiors and various how it looks like. So I think, yeah. yeah. So I think there are many things which you can talk about that. Similarly for roads. In fact, in three conditions we have been able to build. One is for Citco in Washi, where heavy trucks are being used to transport steel and other type of thing, where uh, we have given a, uh, what you call a uh, bamboo grid as a about the subway to some extent because so that it can transfer that for loads to stake uniformly and things. For countries they do the synthetic grids. In fact, you can replace that with uh, bamboo and other things which have been done. There are three sites which have been tried out and Sitco has been monitoring this uh, uh, for quite some time. Now final part of this whole thing is that we are saying that how do we integrate all this into type of production unit. In fact, there is another part which I don't want to go into. I think the next presentation uh, is going to present on the renewable energy component of this, whether it is solar, uh, wind, small hydro, and other type of things, which also come into place in terms of putting this type of uh, biomass based technology in place, because either as process heat to some extent or as electricity. So we are positing this as a type of integrated production from energy unit as the unit which can bring together the different elements of different technologies one place and the renewable energy type of as one both place uh, for the rural toilets and things. We can also discuss about a different type of producer class. The agriculture laborers and also the farmers who produce the biomass and the women's groups or the artisan groups can come together as a type of integrated workplace and things. So last slide. So some of the critical issues. In fact, we have been able to make fairly good headway in the technology part of it. I think the organized institutional part is something which we need to work through, we also are very clear what is the organizational form which can bring together the rural toilets together as one uh, production unit. There are a lot of discussions about it. With the movement we have been discussing this, but I don't think we have been able to get a clear idea about how you organizationally bind all this type of thing, what the type of form which can take, that's one area. Second I think is that the whole question of capacity building the rural toilets in terms of this. What is the resource literacy part of it and how do you make informed choices or different technologies which are available, internalization of this and also another element is about operation maintenance of some of these things at the locally. So that also requires different type of skills. Second or third one is that I begin with it also supposes a radical restructuring of land and water relations, land and water use to some extent and how you pool biomass, the surplus biomass be pooled and brought together as a and make it available to the resource per section that we say this is a new productive potential which you can create, it needs to be treated as a common pool or a common property resource. Changes in policy that goes uh, without saying we have tried to elaborate little bit on the uh, you know, especially subsidies for example we discussed in the morning. You know, where the subsidies go today is basically for the fossil based you know source and type of others you also reorient some of these things. Also there is a discussion about capital subsidy versus you know running uh, what you call running cost to some extent is how you may create the productive assets of it. And also we find that how do you create social demand for this type of techniques? I don't think that for example if state with your interest probably may not support some of these uh, things. But social movements who are working with the different type of social sector probably need to take up this as a social demand and make it the social uh, you know, uh, demand for this type of thing only then can create. And also we should have a clear understanding what is possible within the present system, whether we call it capitalist system or other type of things and what is not possible. And here our take is that properly some of these elements, we do have the freedom to experiment and put it in ground. But you have to really bring it as a one integrated unit, then probably this has to be made part of a more of a transformative politics to some extent. Okay, thanks. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Joy's paper, uh, <laughs> we are in the same uh, process. We were in the same process. Uh, the question in front of all of us is that if uh, water building and roads, these are big sectors, yeah. three big sectors, uh, if generalization is not possible simply because there is no uh, funds for uh, research and development which requires for generalization and development of skills, then if because of only because of that you cannot multiply the whole thing, then what can be done? That is a collective question. And uh, that is actually not answered uh, in a, 
in, in, in so many words, I mean, in details and practically so. So that should be a point of a discussion actually in this kind of forum that uh, that should be also included in the in the uh, in their section. To me, it seems that uh, biomass is uh, captures uh, solar energy through photovoltaic, through through photosynthesis. You know, uh, uh, as compared to you know the the solar, which we more often tend to talk about in terms of photovoltaic, and you know to see to think in terms of you know creating different forms of energy. You know, fossil fuel is two out of ten, and solar uh, photo photo uh, uh, is four out of ten. You know, I would. It would seem to me that you know, photosynthesis is is the most uh, efficient in terms of lowest uh, lowest cost uh, 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 and high high decentralized harvesting uh, with multiple benefits in terms of you know you, you have your products uh, created through your various crops, you have your soil created, you have your greenhouse gas <laughs> absorbed. You know, you, you, you have your water uh, percolation and the maximum uh, 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 employment potential with the lowest kind of cost. So you're taking care of all your needs. You're taking care of your energy needs. You're taking care of your soil regeneration. You're taking care of your products. You're taking care of your food. And all with minimum cost and highest efficiency. So, you know, uh, just a thought, you know, that when we talk about renewable energy, we shouldn't forget the photosynthesis as the the best, uh, most efficient uh, renewable energy to harvest. I don't know whether this is the right place to bring this up, but uh, from what uh, Sharad was saying earlier, that story, uh, it's very instructive because what it shows is that one of the charms of industrial modernity is convenience. And that's something which we have to tackle. So it's not just about efficiencies, it's about convenience. And in India, that's led by a second thing, which is status perception, how people perceive what you're doing. So for instance, a lot of the things that Bharat just said are extremely rational from any sensible ecological perspective. But if people are in an aspirational cognitive mode, they are not looking at that at all. What they're looking at is, what others are doing and to do better than them, especially if they're watching the same TV channels and these same ads. So I'm just throwing this out as something which we need to think about. I'm not sure Joy actually, yeah. to, to what extent in Joy's paper, the biomass as a source of energy has been a focus. I'm not entirely sure. I couldn't quite capture it. Right, material. Because I think if we switch from biomass as a source of material, energy, there are some major issues. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, the land demand of biofuels yes, is yes. just phenomenal. Yeah, no, 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 but you don't look at it exclusively at that. Because if you have a forest, you have your energy captured mm -hmm. there, you have your products created there and that thing, you have your soil created, you have your water harvesting. But it, it is all uh, before, you know, uh, electricity. No, I think you have made your point. Yeah. You have made this yeah, yeah. point. Let's not really yeah. yeah. No, I'm just saying that there yeah. are trade-offs. It's not just a win-win. Even with forests, it's not a win-win. Uh, if you have us there for energy, they don't give you the same <coughs> returns on biodiversity, etc. <coughs> that, that you would think that they might. Uh, I mean, Bharat had raised uh, two issues, I think, if I remember. One is the whole question of uh, generalization of this and whether uh, financial resources is the main uh, constraint. Uh, my point is that, yes, that is one, I mean, in terms of uh, type of financial support. In fact, I think with this kind of technology, even to get bank loans for this, there have been some effort to tie up with HTC, for example, to, you know, uh, uh, especially the building. Uh, can uh, STS, for example, accept some of these designs and maybe make uh, loans available? And that but I think we did have discussed, but it come to too much. Of so, resource is one thing. But I think apart from that, there are many other things which need to fall in place if this has to be actually uh, generalized to some extent. One is that, for example, in the entire Maharashtra today, we have one good treatment plant. I think that is set up by one private party in the Congress. Now when we are building these structures in Tasegao, it involved transportation about what about 150 kilometers. So the whole full blossoming the whole thing it also returns. Otherwise what we talk about decentralized production units if the good 
treated wood has to come from 150 kilometers away, then it does compromise on the energy and things like that. So we need certain facilities to be created and that kind Second is the whole R&D effort. We have been able to do with some support from DST and other type of the certain type of thing. But we are not saying that we have a full finished, you know, because there are a lot of efforts need to be taken up. And so R&D support, I think some of the issues, I think when uh, Dinesh uh, Abrol's paper is being discussed tomorrow day after, and as well as uh, Rajiv's paper, I think we'll talk about the whole, uh, reorienting the whole entire, uh, you know, scientific establishment towards some of these issues also an important thing. That's why I'm saying that, some of the movement. Now, for example, there are all the civil society groups uh, involved in watershed development, hmm? which are very dispersed and decentralized development forms. You look at the way the money is spent. Today, you have something about 13,000 rupees per hectare. If you have a 500 hectare, you have more than one crore at a micro water scale. 80% of the money goes into construction, and out of that, about nearly 70% goes into cement structures. Now, even if you reorient that, so, I think this reorganized mindset change need to take place even from civil society, uh, saying that if can't be no go for timber gabions instead of that. There are a lot of other technical advantages of timber gabions that are able to get into uh, things. Uh, second issue is the use of renewables in the uh, renewable materials in the whole renewable energy production systems. In fact, one of the Dathis dream was how do you replace the structural components of windmills, for example, the blades as well as the towers. And the worst thing in fact, we did start some work with MEDA, Maharashtra Energy Development Agency, which said, can we not bring in composites instead of today the energy? So there are seven things we did start off, but we have not been able to bring it up. But that's an area I think we need to. Now, with uh, uh, interesting developments in, uh, for example, reconstituted bamboo. See, bamboo has other structural limitations also. If you put a nail to it, it splits. Yeah. Now, in Mumbai, there's a unit where they, like, show can you crush it. You crush the bamboo, take the fiber out, again reconstitute it under pressure and adhesives. It gives you fantastic material which is workable, which is weight by weight equivalent to steel today. Yeah. So there are a whole lot of cutting ends, technology development, uh, which you can hammer and a whole lot of things. And RCB, that is reconstituted bamboo, is another major area which is coming up where we can use such materials. So there are areas of work which is being done. Shannon's point is well taken. In fact, initial consultation, we also thought of biofuels, but we have moved out of it for two reasons. One is this whole debate about food versus oil to some extent, and also it's uh, environmental cost to some extent. If you especially use a thermal route for energy production to biomass, then pollution and other things can uh, come up. So we don't advocate that. Just two points that I want to make, which I want in time to make the presentation, is that what is that about economic or value addition potential, which I didn't cover. Now, we, our analysis in the application of small dimension timber or bamboo in the construction industry shows that if we use 1 kg biomass, small dimension, then it can give about 7 kg, rupees 7 for, per kg for the worker and to 2 to 3 kg, uh, rupees per kg to the producer. So, this way, have a total value of about 8 to 10 rupees. That's the type of analysis works out if the system works optimally. In terms of energy self reliance, now this IPUs, integrated uh, production of energy technology, if it is a vibrant system spread out all over, then it compares well with what the energy availability in the Western countries had during the world, post World War II. It is estimated they had something about 4000 uh, kilogram oil equivalent uh, type of thing. And even if we say that 50% of that went into heating and cooling and various other type of thing, this, if they had available about 2000, and I think Raya's study, which I think Vivek himself has quoted, is that for a dignified human life, we require something to the order of uh, 1200 to 1400 to 1800 or something uh, kilogram uh, oil equivalent. And this type of system which I am talking about has a potential of 2400 kilogram oil equivalent, which can give you a dispersed uh, protective potential. I have been even called energy, it is a potential which is to be at the hands of. So, the whole discussion about land redistribution, water redistribution, I think we need to talk about redistribution of this productive potential which is there. So the whole conceptualization of means of production also need to change to some extent. Otherwise we still get stuck in the feudal where land was a very serious, uh, you know, uh, even now today at least, redistribution is an important uh, condition. But I think we need to go beyond and talk about these type of new emerging commons uh, where the toiling uh, people should have control about uh, efficiency uh, of photosynthesis uh, compared to efficiency of photovoltaic <laughs> and I think uh, 
Uh, of course, photosynthesis has a higher value for a whole range of uh, dozen reasons. But when you compare efficiency for energy conversion, uh, I think that needs little correction because it is not the most efficient way. I mean, it's a matter of debate. Uh, the efficiency of photovoltaic is 10% and of photosynthesis is 1%. Uh, but that needs re-examination. Uh, your paper also refers a number of times to VRE, uh, that is, but I don't know whether you have taken into account the whole uh, cost of storage. Because uh, solar photovoltaic energy cost was earlier days 20 rupees per uh, uh, unit came down to 16, 14, now it is something like 7. And they say it will come to about 4 rupees in 5 years time. So cost have really come down from 20 rupees to 4 rupees. But if you want to store it, then the storage cost has probably not come down and there are environmental hazards of storage also. Whether it's a lead battery or lithium battery. So all that needs a little more discussion. I mean, because if you just, uh, if you're talking about, uh, if you're uh, putting into the grid, then it's a different issue. But if you want to use it at night, then storage cost has to be taken into account. Currently, storage cost is not 5 rupees per uh, unit. So the total comes to about 10 rupees per unit compared to other sources. So I think that wind, uh, similarly. So I think that. And lastly, Joyce's paper, uh, this 2400, that doesn't give any reference. So maybe there is some research being done. Yeah. The only reference is your paper, but what is the, uh, uh, is there any, uh, anything else which is there? So I think that needs to be circulated. Yeah. Uh, just, so to re just to respond quickly, yeah. uh, I think, uh, yes, storage, the costs have to come down, but uh, for the small systems that we're talking about, the, it's still feasible despite storage, because the kind of storage is so little bit. Uh, but but when we talk about grid level storage, yes, absolutely, I think. But local storage is a cost. It is, but even including that, you can, it's still a workable model uh, as compared to what. So you can say abortion costs so much, but even in 10 rupees per unit, uh, people will afford it. That's a separate argument. Yeah. But the cost is certainly almost 10 rupees per capita at decentralized level. That's what I want to register. Then you can say that, okay, people are ready to pay 10 rupees and get into production mode and make money out of it. That's okay. That's a different argument. Yeah. Shall we? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's about uh, efficiency uh, of photosynthesis uh, compared to efficiency of photovoltaic. <laughs> and I think, uh, uh, of course, photosynthesis has a higher value for a whole range of uh, dozen reasons. But when you compare efficiency for energy conversion, uh, I think that needs little correction because it is not the most efficient way. I mean, it's a matter of debate. Uh, the efficiency of photovoltaic is 10% and of photosynthesis is 1%. Uh, but that needs re examination. Yes. Uh, and lastly, Joyce's paper, uh, this 2400, that doesn't give any reference. So maybe there is some research being done. Yeah. The only reference is your paper. But what is the. Uh, is there any, anything else which is there? So I think that needs to be circulated.